It is truly amazing how God can use the smallest thing to transform lives in the most unexpected ways. One of the most familiar words and themes of the Christmas season is peace. On the night that Jesus was born, the shepherds appeared in the sky. Actually, the angels appeared in the sky and they told the shepherds, Peace on earth to all of whom God, God's favor rests. This morning we want to talk about the peace of Christmas. As I prepared to talk to you this morning about the peace of Christmas this week, I googled those two words, Christmas peace, just to see what I might get. I got all sorts of things. Basically, I got what I expected to get. I got idyllic pictures of rolling hillsides covered in snow under beautiful starry skies. I got pictures of people sitting in front of a roaring fireplace drinking hot cocoa. I got more pictures of peace signs made out of ornaments and wreaths than I ever really wanted to see. One would have been more than I really wanted to see, but I got a whole lot of, I even got a few pictures with Bible verses on them, peace on earth. But you know what I didn't get? I didn't get anything that really described what Christmas peace really is. You see, I got a bunch of sentimental things, things which might be good, things which might be enjoyable, things which might be make us feel all right. But what I, I didn't get anything that declared what Christmas peace really is. You see, the peace of Christmas is not a sentimental feeling. The peace of Christmas is Jesus came to reconcile man to God. That's why we started the service this morning with heart the herald angels sing. <coughs> peace on earth. God and sinners reconcile. That is the point. There really is no other point. If you think about those words that the angels sang to the shepherds, that had to be what they were talking about. You see, the shepherds, when they said you can have peace, lived very hard lives. Before that Jesus came and after Jesus came, they didn't live lives anything like all of those sentimental scenes. Mary and Joseph were off with the feast of Christmas, even though their life is going to be very hard in very many ways. And today I know that there are people who absolutely know the peace of Christmas, even though they're external lives don't look anything like those sentimental scenes. They live in poverty, they live in upset, they live in pain, but they know the peace of God. I also know this morning there are people who have all of that picturesque sentiment. The fire is good, the cocoa is hot, the tree is decorated, the scene outside the window is beautiful, but inside of their lives they do not know the peace that only God can give. This morning we want to talk about peace. Not about sentimental images, but about the peace that only can come through what Jesus Christ did for us. We want to look this morning at the passage in Romans 5 and the passage in Colossians 1 and understand that the peace of Christmas is not sentiment. It is God forgiving sinners and reconciling His creation to Himself. We have to understand that it has to happen because Christmas offers peace to people who are at war with God. You say, wait a minute, that's a very strong statement. You just said people who are at war with God. And yes, that's what I said, because that's what the Bible says. If you read the passages, listen again to the passage we read this morning. In Romans 5, 6, we are told that we were ungodly. In Romans 5, 8, we were told that we were sinners. In Romans 5, 10, we are told that we were enemies of God. Colossians one says that we were hostile in mind to God. All of those words are saying the same thing. People without Christ are naturally opposed to God. People without Christ are naturally at war with God because that is who we are and that is true because without Christ we are born in sin. Without Christ we are at war with God because we are born in sin. Sin is not something that we do. Sin is who we are. Look again at Romans 5.12. Just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Do you hear that? Death came when Adam, our first father, sinned because when he sinned, we all sinned. That passage goes on in verse 17 to say that we all receive 
condemnation due to the sin of Adam because his sin was passed on to us. David understood that when he wrote the 51st Psalm and he said, I was conceived in sin and my mother brought me forth in sin. It is again, sin is not what you do, it is who you are. And we were all became sinners when Adam sinned. And so the point this morning is that we were war with God and we have not met Jesus Christ because every single person in the creation that God has made is an evil, wicked, wretched sinner and they were born that way. That is the point. That is where we must begin because that is why we need to have peace. We were all born in our trespasses and sins. All of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. That is who we are. And we were born that way. And when we were born that way, we're under the condemnation of God. And as I say that, it might be very easy for somebody to say, wait a minute. I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's right. Why should I be judged for something that Adam did? I never met Adam. I don't know him. I don't know anything about what he did other than what the Bible tells me. Why should I be judged for what he did? First, because he passed his sin on to you when sin entered the human race. But second, it's not just that you were born in sin, it's that you are an active sinner. Look at the next thing we must know. Without Christ, all people are war with God because they're engaged in evil deeds. Colossians 1.21 and although you were formerly alienated from God and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. I already said sin is not just what you do, it's who you are. But it's also not just who you are, it's what you do. There are no good people. We already tell ourselves that I am basically a good person. We compare ourselves to this one and that one. But Romans 3 says there are no good people. There are no righteous people. All of them become useless. All of them rebel against God. All are hostile to God. All have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And because of that, we're all far away from God because of what we do. Again, somebody in this room is almost certainly trying to tell themselves, I don't, I don't believe that about myself. I think I'm basically a very good person. I know that because that is the default setting of people. We all want to tell ourselves that we are basically good people. Think about it this way. This is an approach to evangelism that some people take when they approach people and say, hey, I'm basically a good person. They ask the question, have you ever told a lie? I would imagine that nobody in this room could, without lying, say they've never told a lie. So what does that make you? A liar. Have you ever taken anything, even as a child, that didn't belong to you? I imagine that most people have done that, and what that makes you is a thief. Have you ever looked at somebody with lust in your heart? The Bible tells us that that makes you an adulterer. Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? The Bible tells us that that makes you a blasphemer. So while you sit there saying, I am a good person, you just admitted to yourself that you were a lying, thieving, adulterous blasphemer. You are not a good person. I am not a good person. The Bible says that we are all engaged in evil deeds. And when we compare our lives to the great commandment of the law, which Jesus said was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, the truth is, in the last 15 seconds, and you've been listening to me, in the last 15 seconds that I've been talking to you, that every single person in this room has committed enough sin to send themselves to hell because we fell short of all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. There are no good people. Without Christ, we're all at war with God because we're engaged in evil deeds. And also notice, without Christ, all people are at war with God because they are enemies of God. Again, a strong statement. What do you mean, I'm an enemy of God? No, people would say, I love God, I worship God, I honor God, I just don't have that born again with Jesus experience. No! You hate God. That's what the Bible says. Romans says you're an enemy of God. Colossians 1 says you're hostile in mind 
to God, all people who have not been born again are in fact hostile to God. You might say, I don't believe that. I love God. No, you love a God that was created in your own mind. You love a God you made in your own image. Maybe you love the things that God can give you. But if we have not been born again, the Bible tells us that every single one of us is dead in our trespasses and sin. A child of the devil and actually hostile to God. And so therefore, the war goes on and the war goes on. Because without Christ, all people are at war with God because they are under condemnation. Romans 5, 14. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Adam died because he sinned, and death continued to reign until Moses and the law came, and men continued to die. Romans 5, 18. So then it's through one transgression that results in condemnation to all men. When our first father sinned, all people fell into condemnation. That is literally a death sentence. You see, God says the wages of sin is death. That is why when Adam and Eve sinned, they began to physically die and immediately were pushed out of the garden. That is why the death rate and the birth rate of this world is one to one. That is why Hebrews tells us that it is appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. That is why we're all under condemnation and it is only natural to be hostile to the one who pronounced the death sentence on you and said, there's nothing you can do about it. All men are at war with God and under condemnation. And finally, about all men, notice that without Christ, all people are at war with God because they were alienated from God. Colossians 1.21 says you were formerly alienated. That means completely and totally cut off. We were created to walk with God, fellowship with God, and be with God. But when sin entered the world, we became separated from Him. One, because we no longer wanted to be with Him, but also because our God is so holy that He will not look upon sin. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. When we live in unconfessed, unregenerate sin, we are separated from God. If you look at the first Christmas morning, the shepherds are a great picture of that. They were not allowed to go to the temple. They were not allowed in private society because they were perpetually unclean. Because they always had to deal with the sheep. They always had to deal with things that made them unclean. So any good priest would say, Sir, you're not allowed in the temple. You're not allowed in the presence of God. And that's who we all are without Christ. Not allowed in the presence of God because our sin is so great. We begin this morning with we need peace at Christmas because all people are hostile to God. All people are at war with God. But notice secondly this morning, we need Christmas peace because of the wrath of God. Christmas offers peace from the wrath of God. You say, Tim, that statement doesn't comport with many people's conception of Christmas and the message of the gospel, but it's absolutely necessary that all to know that all people are sinners and under condemnation, which is the law of God. The decision of God is without Christ, there is a death sentence, and it's pronounced on all of us. That is true because our God is a God of wrath. Step back a little bit from that. You see, that is the only explanation for Jesus. If God was not full of wrath and sin and sinners, there would have been no purpose for the cross, no purpose for anything that we celebrate, and everything we do at Christmas would just be sentimental, feel-good stuff. God is angry, and His wrath is absolutely necessary and ends up exalting His holiness. You say, I want to believe in a God of love and not a God of wrath. That doesn't make any sense. You understand it. Let me explain it to you this way. Gentlemen, if you saw someone attacking your wife and did not feel anger for that person, I suggest to you that you do not love your wife. All of us can understand that if you say, hey, I love unborn children, and oh, the abortion industry in this country is just fine, and I don't have any reaction to that, the only explanation.
explanation for that is we do not love unborn children. If there is not anger and wrath to protect that which we love, that can only mean we do not love. And so when God is holy and God is just, His anger and His wrath protect that and indicate how holy, how just, and how powerful He is. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 9, He let Pharaoh be raised up so He could display His wrath upon him to receive the glory from it. Romans 9 goes on to say that God endured sinners for a long time in order that His love and His mercy might be revealed to those who are going to believe because God's wrath is necessary and ends up exalting Himself. And then let's ask the question, where is God's wrath aimed at? What is the what is the object of God's wrath? Here's an important answer to that. God's wrath is poured out on sinners. God's wrath is poured out on sinners. That is the people who have committed sin. I know it's common in this day to say that God hates the sin and loves the sinners. And in some small degree that, that's right, but we must not forget it's the sinner that is under condemnation, not the sin. It's the sinner who will be sent to hell if they don't repent, not the sin. Let me read you some verses which explain that. Psalm 5.5 5 says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes, and referring to God says, You hate all who do iniquity. John 3.36 says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Did you hear the words of those verses? God hates those who do iniquity. The wrath of God abides on the person who does not believe. Psalm, we can go on. Psalm 11.5, the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Again, the wrath of God is poured out on sinners on actual people. The wrath of God is there. We need peace from that. And somebody might ask, hey, if the wrath of God is on sinful people, why does so much sin go on if God's wrath is so great? And the answer to that is God's wrath is being held back. It is a great blessing that God does not just pour out His wrath in the first time we commit sin, but God, in fact, holds it back. Romans 2.4 asks this question of those who have not yet believed. It says, Do you think lightly of the riches and kindness and the intolerance and patience of God, which He gives you to lead you to repentance? 1 Thessalonians warns us to be saved from the wrath to come. When people came out to John the Baptist, he said, who warned you from fleeing for the wrath to come? Because the wrath has not all appeared yet, because it is being held back. There's a great mercy in that. Adam and Eve got an opportunity to repent after they sinned. You get an opportunity to repent after you sin, but that does not mean that the wrath of God is not out there and it does not exist. And in fact, it is being stored up. Look at Romans 2 5. It says, Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath, the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He says, Storing up. What a horrible concept. As the wrath of God builds and builds, and our sin grows and grows, it just is stored up. And store it up. And store it up. One day for the dam to break and all will become flowing out. That means while you think, hey, I got away with my sin. I don't have to acknowledge God. I can just continue to do whatever I want to do. No. All you're doing in your sin that you have not confessed is storing up the wrath of God to be poured out one day. It is being stored up. And it is more than anyone can stand. Many people might say, you know what? I understand that God is angry at sin, maybe even angry at me, but I but I think I can handle that. No, your good works will not appease God. 
No, you cannot spend a couple of years in purgatory, which does not exist anyway, and appease God over time. No, you're not going to get a slap on the wrist. No, the wrath of God is going to be poured out on all the ungodly and all the unrighteous, so that the wrath of God and the justice of God will be made known. It is people who have rejected God who will spend eternity in the lake of fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Christmas offers peace to people who are at war with God. Christmas offers peace with a God who is wrathful of sin. But notice thirdly this morning that Christmas offers peace through the coming of Jesus. All I've said so far is the bad news, but now we move on to the good. Remember the words of the angels to the shepherds in Luke 2, 10, 11. Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which is for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And in verse 14, glory to God in the highest, on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. There was a great war between sinful man and a holy God, who was, who was characterized by wrath, but then Jesus came, and as he came on that first Christmas, we must notice what he did. He came as fully God and fully man. I know many of you have seen the nativity scene, and you look at the little manger in the middle, and there's a, there's a baby laying in it. Before you get sentimental about that, think about who is laying there. First, it is completely, fully Totally God. Colossians 1 says it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness of deity to dwell in Him. That is God incarnate. God with us. But also, Jesus in that manger and Jesus throughout His life was fully a man. Hebrews tells us that He became a man to become our great high priest that He would understand all the things we struggle with. He knew what it was to be hungry. He knows what it is to be he knows what it is to feel pain. He knows what it is to have emotion. He knows all of those things that come from being a man. He emptied himself of his glory and became a man so that he could go and die on a cross for us. As we look at the man, we must say, yes, there is God and there is man. And he is one together. And he came not just to have a sentimental scene in a manger set. He came to be our substitute. He came to be our substitute. You see, we've already said that the wrath of God is poured out on sinners and that no man and no woman can ever stand against the overwhelming anger of God and their overwhelming sin. But the message of Christmas is that Jesus came to take our place and thus make peace. Colossians 1.20 And through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, but He having made peace through the blood of His cross. Peace was created when the condemnation that was due to us was poured out on Him. The greatest verse in the Bible about that is Isaiah 53. Let me read this to you. It says, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. In verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as far as the generation who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. He took our place. The wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus Christ and not upon me. It was poured out upon Jesus Christ and not upon anyone who has known Him and confessed their sin and who Jesus is their Lord. He took our place. He is our substitute. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. He is our substitute and He did it fully. He satisfied God's wrath. It's not through Jesus took part of it. It's He took it all. 1 John 4, 9 and 10. By this the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. And this is love, not God, but He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. I hope you heard the Christmas story in that. 
He sent His Son. And then you heard another word. You heard propitiation. You say, what does that mean? That the word is about this long. But it simply means this. It means the satisfaction of the wrath of God. Every bit of the wrath of God due to sinners was poured out upon Jesus Christ. If we have confessed our sin and been born again, it will not come to us. And that is what peace is. That is why we can have peace. He satisfied the wrath of God. Romans 3 says exactly the same thing. Jesus came and was displayed as propitiation of His blood for our sin so God could declare us righteous. The bad news was we were enemies of God, born in sin, engaged in evil deeds, under condemnation, and with the wrathful, holy, and just God storing up wrath to pour out upon us. But the good news is Jesus paid it all. All of him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. But he washed it white as snow. That is the message of Christmas peace. He came to satisfy, and he not only came to satisfy, he finished satisfying. Colossians tells us that he made peace through the blood of his cross. Romans tells us that we are justified by his blood. As we think about that awful picture of Jesus dying for our sin, I encourage you to remember the last thing that Jesus said on the cross. Remember what it was? Finished. Finished. Nothing more to pay. Nothing more to do. Nothing more to sacrifice. I have gotten to the end, is what Jesus said. I have finished it. That is why we can celebrate. That is why we can know Him and praise God as Jesus came to be our substitute and to satisfy the wrath of God. He came to call people to Himself. Christmas has always been about an invitation. On the first Christmas morning, the angels invited the shepherds and they came. God sent a star to the Magi in the East and they came. God invited Mary and Joseph to be this parents of Jesus and they came and those who left that manger and left that house where the Magi came went out and they told other people and they were invited. It makes no difference how much you have sinned. Jesus is tenderly called today. It makes no difference how much enmity you have between you and God. Our God stands ready to forgive all who will come to Him and all will say, Lord, I am a sinner. There's nothing I can do about it. Jesus stands ready to give all of those things to you because He is inviting people to come and experience His overwhelming peace. But finally this morning, and briefly, Christmas offers peace through the blessings of salvation for all who believe. Sinners who are under the condemnation of God are justly facing the wrath of God, but they can be saved from that wrath to come and receive the benefits. So what does Jesus offer? He offers justification. Romans 5.9, much more than having been justified by His blood. Romans 5.18, through one act of righteousness there resulted in justification of life to all men. Justification, that's another long word. But it simply means that God declares you just like you've ever seen. We all know that we're sinners. We all know that we're not good. We ought to know that we will stand before God and be judged one day and that God is holy and just and wrath is part of that holiness and part of that justice. But if we have come to Jesus Christ, then He will look at us and not see our sin. He will look at us and see the blood of His Son which forgave our sin and declare us to be innocent. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. And that's why Jesus came at Christmas to offer justification, but also to offer reconciliation. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, 
and he has now reconciled you in the fleshly body through his death. Our sin created great separation. Romans 5 also says, by his blood, he reconciled us. Here's more good news. You can live your life, all of your life, and through all of eternity, walking with God, talking with God, knowing God, being a member of God's family, being called a friend of God, because He who came on Christmas to be your substitute, to satisfy His Father's wrath, has offered you an opportunity to come back together with God and be reconciled, and He is the only way that can happen. There is no way into the presence of God. There is no way to have a relationship with God except by the shed blood of His Son. But that shed blood is there and it's calling and it's on offer. And if you will call, you can come with absolute certainty. One of the greatest necessities for having peace is certainty. If you don't know what comes tomorrow, you won't live in peace tonight. You don't know what comes next year. You will worry about it all this year. But our God says you can be absolutely certain that the gifts of God are there and they can never ever be lost. Again, look back at the passages that we read. Romans 5 9 says we shall be saved from the wrath of God. Not we hope we will be, we shall be. Romans 5 10 says we shall be saved by His life. Verse 11, we have received reconciliation. It is an accomplished fact. Verse 17, we will reign through the one Jesus Christ. All of those things are absolute declarations of certainty. We can have peace at Christmas because we do not wish upon a star. We stand upon a rock that does not we do not hope for the gifts of God like we hope for something to be under the tree. We hope somebody who thought to buy it for us. And we go, and sometimes we get it, and sometimes we're disappointed. The gifts of God, the reconciliation, the justification, the satisfaction of God's wrath are absolute certainties offered to all who believe and can never, ever be taken away. And because that is true, we can come and worship our God. Because that is true, we ought to exalt and worship. Look at Romans 5.11. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom we have received the reconciliation. That says that if we know what Jesus has given to us, we will worship Him. All of those things I got when I Googled Christmas peace are designed to give you a good momentary feeling. And there's nothing wrong with a good momentary feeling. But that's not what the Bible offers. That's not what Jesus offers. Jesus offers something that is permanent, something that will stir your emotion up. Just think about it. If you know that you were born in your sin, but God has made you innocent and declared you righteous, that ought to stir your heart to worship and you ought to shout for joy. If you know that you are under the condemnation of God, but all that condemnation and wrath is poured out on Jesus Christ, it will not be poured out upon you. That will stir your heart, drive you to worship, and make you shout with joy. If you know that you can be absolutely certain of what comes next, because the Bible says that you will never be taken out of the hands of God, that will stir your heart. Drive your emotion, make you shout with joy. If you know what God has given to you, you ought to get excited about it because it's so good and so wonderful. If you can think about the gifts that God gave you without emotion rising in your heart, there's something terribly wrong with your heart. If you need something sentimental to give you peace, it's because you do not know the peace that only God can offer. The Bible offers you, Jesus offers you, and this morning I offer you the peace that only comes in Jesus Christ. And if we have that, we must make sure that the peace of Christmas is the center of our, seat, the center of our celebration. 
the offer of Christmas peace ought to be the center of our lives. In order to do that, first we have to make sure that we have that peace. Have you been born again? Have you confessed your sin? Has Jesus forgiven your sin? And what is the evidence of that? If there is any doubt, today is the day to make sure there is no doubt. Call the crowd. If you say, yes, I have that peace, center your simpler. You will run, you will shop, you will go to parties, you will take tests, you will do all those things that can destroy your peace. But make your center of your life just as Make that what you're about. And tell somebody about it. I guarantee you, you know somebody who lives with no peace. They may be sitting home tonight with a cup of coffee and a roaring fire and loving family members around them. But if they don't know that Jesus Christ has forgiven their sin, they have no certainty for tomorrow, they have no peace for today, and they need somebody to tell them what it is. Would you invite them to your church so we can tell them what you Would you pray for them that they would know what it would be? Would you make Jesus and his peace the center of all of Your Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you this morning for all that you've done. Oh Lord God, I thank you for all that you can prove to do. I just pray that we would be moved by your power. Oh Lord God, I pray that we respond to you. Christ. Amen. If God has spoken.